In the last episode, we saw that in 2014, Gwyneth Martha and Samir Scarface were eliminated under very suspicious circumstances. It is more than likely that Najib Zigi Himish has played a role in both of their cases. His eagerness to become the top dog will come at great costs and will have you questioning whether it was worth it or not. At this point, tensions are so high and so many involved are becoming paranoid. Eliminations are taking place as preventative measure. It is becoming clear that they rather eliminate someone just in case, as it means that there is one less potential problem to worry about. Nobody is safe. Not even 9,000 kilometers away from Amsterdam. After what had happened to Massad, it had been relatively quiet for some time. The feud was still brewing, the silence mainly stemmed from the fact that many role players were getting jailed or buried. Police recognized they had serious problems in Amsterdam and significantly increased the efforts of combating crime. Many blamed the police and the mayor of Amsterdam for being way too late and ignorant. They allowed the Mokro war to escalate and now there had already been a lot of unnecessary grief. Well, what happened next is another prime example of how disrespectful and relentless the Mokro feud was. A new low again. After what had happened in Spain to Samir Scarface and Najib's alleged involvement, nothing is heard of Najib anymore. His wife Luana used to talk to him every day, but from November 2014 on, she does not hear anything anymore. She knew he was in Madrid the last time she spoke to him and decided to travel with their kids to the Spanish city in the hopes of finding her boyfriend. After a few days looking for him, there was still no contact. Soon it became clear that Luana was not the only one looking for Najib. However, the way someone tried to lure him out of the shadows is horrendous and simply unimaginable. On the 8th of December 2014, Luana is back in the Netherlands. She did not manage to get in contact with Najib and returned to Madrid. Approximately 7.30 in the evening, Luana arrives with her mother and her two kids at her home. As she walks out of her car, a black BMW approaches. A man hops out and unleashes on Luana right in front of her mother and kids. This is such a tragic event that I would like to keep it brief and not get into specifics. That the Mokro war is borderless is clear, but what happened nearly 9,000 kilometers from Amsterdam was a surprise to everyone involved. That 9,000 kilometers brings you to Panama City. Yes, this feud really has a chapter taking place in Panama too. It's December the 27th, 2014 when a bunch of Moroccan guys from Amsterdam are partying in a club in Panama City. One of them is Khalid Jafar. It remains unclear whether he was an actual important player to the Mokro feud. All that was clear is that he was there with several men who were crucial players in the battle. One of these crucial players was Khalid J, a long-time confidant of Gwinnett's Martha. Just to clarify, Khalid Jafar and Khalid J were not family. The pair is joined by another criminal from Amsterdam, Isham B. As the group walks out of the club, multiple rounds are fired. Khalid J remains uninjured. Isham B is struck but survives after getting help in the hospital. Khalid Jafar, however, is struck fatally. In regard to this incident, it remains unclear whether the actual target was hit or not, because Khalid Jafar was not an important role player in the feud, which makes it seem more likely that they were after Khalid J. Till this day, it remains unclear. Panamanian police immediately apprehended a Frenchman and a Colombian man, but they denied all allegations and have not been given any insight into what happened and why. Nevertheless, this incident showed that you are not safe anywhere in the world. If they want you, they'll get you. So, the previous incidents with Khalid Jafar showed that the war was borderless. The following incident will once again show that the war is not only borderless, but also that no one forgets anything ever. Do you remember what exactly started this Mokro feud? The events that took place three years prior to the incident we are going to discuss right now. The setup of Najeb Bubu at the Crown Plaza Hotel in Antwerp on the 18th of October 2012. Machano Pokorni was one of the alleged men, together with Rida Menajem who carried out the assignment on this hit. As you might remember from episode two, Rida Benajem was placed on the Dutch national most wanted list after the hit on Bubu. 
but eventually got taken out by someone from Gwinnett's camp in March 2013. Marciano Pocorni was arrested, but later released due to the lack of evidence. However, in the underworld, they don't care about what a judge says, they deal with it on their own, and it was obvious that it would come back to haunt him, which it did on October 10th, 2014. Marciano is at a bar in Amsterdam called Café the Sun, when two men rush in and start unleashing from the door opening, hitting almost everything except their intended target, Marciano Pocorni. They even hit two innocent people who were just having a drink at the bar. Marciano got really lucky because he was able to hide behind a slot machine. Immediately after this incident, he fled to his native country, Suriname. After the incident, he was paranoid. He knew his opponents would not rest before they finished the job, and he was right. The 2nd of March 2015, five months after the first attempt, Machano is sitting in a shisha lounge in Paramaribo, nearly 7,500 kilometers away from Amsterdam. As Machano is sitting down, a man enters the lounge and immediately goes for his target. Not even 30 seconds later, he is seen fleeing the scene. He has not been caught till this day. After three years, Machano got a taste of his own medicine. This brings us back to the Netherlands again. Remember Suhail Lachir from episode two, Ben Aouf's financial man, the one who was removed off the playing field in the crowded party at the waterfront. Many of Gwinnett's men were in attendance at that party. One of them was Aeneas Lomp. Aeneas had a big track record and was one of Gwinnett's trusted men. If Gwinnett gave him a job, it would be done accordingly. Aeneas was arrested for what happened to Suhail, but released the same night. Aeneas had already left the event when it all took place, so he could not have been the one who did it or had anything to do with it. He is, however, responsible for what happened to the innocent civilian Stefan E., the father of a child, who just happened to live in the same neighborhood and drive the same car as Omar Lekorf. Police found the tool that was used for the loss of this innocent man in Aeneas's home. He was a prime suspect, yet the court allowed him to await his trial and freedom. This was probably something Aeneas was very happy about. However, looking back, he might have been better off in jail because what happens next is crazy and once again shows that no one can be trusted. In the night of Friday the 6th to Saturday the 7th, November 2015, Aeneas met up with his friend Danny M in the city centre of Amsterdam. Aeneas came by train to Amsterdam from his girlfriend's house in Kromeni. They were going to different bars to have drinks and have a good time. What Aeneas did not know was that Danny M, his supposed friend, had entirely different plans for the evening. As they were in the city center, Danny M was eager to get Aeneas drunk. Why, you think? So that what was about to happen next was just a bit easier. Messages revealed that the entire night, Danny M was in contact with three other people. Some of the messages he sent read, we are going to invest in some liquor, so he gets really drunk. A response to this message reads, no mercy, please. I will not get this chance again. As the night goes on, Aeneas is very drunk and takes the train back home to Cromini, not having a clue what is about to happen. He even texted his supposed friend Danny M that he is almost home safely. Around that time, Danny M also received another text message from someone else, saying, where is he? We are freezing out here. Danny M responded, he is almost there, get ready. As Aeneas leaves the train station Cromeni, he walks towards his girlfriend's house around a few minutes before two o'clock at night. All of a sudden, two men run up to him, and before he even knew it, he was fixed. That was the end of Aeneas, the mastermind behind this event, Omar Lekorf. Omar was the man Aeneas wanted to take out on the 13th of July, 2014, but instead struck innocent Stefan E. No one forgets anything. And a year later, Omar returned the favor. Here we are, in November 2015, just three years after the start of this mock refute with a long trail of horrendous events as a result. What started off as a deal gone wrong in 2012 turned into a feud that left many fallen soldiers along the way. What do you think? Was all this worth it over a shipment of just 200 kilos? I think many would agree that the root cause was absolutely not in proportion to all that happened afterwards. This entire series of four episodes shows firsthand that no one in the underworld can be trusted. It is a world full of betrayal, greed, jealousy, 
and ruthlessness. The Netherlands had not seen such acts before. Conflicts in the underworld were usually handled somewhere outside the public eye, far away on an abandoned parking lot. Women and children were forbidden territory and would not become involved. Now, all of a sudden, it took place right in the city centre of Amsterdam, in quiet neighbourhoods, in broad daylight, and right around the corner of your favourite coffee spot. Young guys, often from low-income families, who had a lust for money were easily influenced to take care of jobs for some fast cash. They hoped to make a name for themselves and rise through the ranks, but most of the time they were nothing more than disposable foot soldiers. Instead of hiring professionals from the Balkan to take care of the hit, these Moroccan kingpins now chose to hire these young men who had never held a weapon. This amateurism was visible quite often. They were inexperienced and caused trouble because they did not know how to handle their tools. These are tens of stories about failure, mostly due to inexperience, but many also because of defected weaponry. But what can you expect? Some of these guys took on jobs for just 5,000 euros. After three years, nearly all the key players are now gone or serving very long jail sentences. Ben Aouf is one of those spending a long time in jail. His rivals, Gwinnett Martha, Najeb Bubu, Najib Himish, Samir Scarface, are all gone. I do wonder what his life will look like once he is released. There will definitely still be heirs from group Gwinnett that seek revenge. Fast forward to 2023, there are now over 60 cases related to this feud, and nine innocent civilian lives were taken. At this point, some of the events happening are hard to credit to the feud about the original missing shipment. So much has happened that it is hard to make direct links. There are still plenty of families and friends that seek revenge for what was done to their loved ones. The question is, will it ever stop? I hope you have not forgotten about the turtles from episode 1. Remember? The group from Borgo Hout in Belgium that were considered the experts in the port of Antwerp and were hired in the last minute to find the missing shipment. They suddenly had a lot of cash, expensive cars and jewellery. Till this day, it is still unclear whether they took the shipment or not. There did occur some interesting things regarding them though. Stay tuned for another video on that. This series took a lot of time, hard work and dedication to research, write and edit. This is my biggest project to date and I hope you have really enjoyed it. Please take a second to hit the like button, subscribe and leave a comment. I always look forward to discussing things with you guys and getting feedback. If you enjoy these longer types of series, drop suggestions below I could do another mini doc on.